Okay, for next week, uh, the reading will be a little bit longer than usual. Next week, we're reading books 11 and the beginning of book 12. Uh, so please read up to page 143. Um, I'm hoping to try to include as much of Odysseus's adventures as I could fit and uh, not make your reading too long. So please read up to the end of page 143. Okay, let's jump back to the beginning, page 109. Um, let's look at the summary of book nine that is at the top half of the page. Um, first, they go to a place and meet the Cycones, uh, and they fight them, and some of Odysseus's men are killed. Uh, and then at the end of line three, Another storm struck the fleet, and the ships reached the land of the lotus eaters, who tempted some of the men to eat the lotus fruit and forget all thoughts of home. So you can think of the lotus as like a kind of drug, xiang ya pian. And once you eat the fruit, you have no other desires except to continue eating the fruit. Uh, once they find out, uh, by sacrificing a few of Odysseus's men, Odysseus ordered the whole crew back on board. They reached the island of the Cyclops, where they found a cave inhabited by a large, solitary shepherd named Polyphemus. Uh, so a Cyclops in English is Dui and Druso, because of this story. Uh, so they get there, there's a cave and a cyclops named Polyphemus. Odysseus left most of his crew with the ships, so he's starting to get careful now. He only takes 12 men and a sack of special wine with him to visit the native inhabitant. Finding him absent, they broke into the cave. So notice Odysseus breaks into this guy's house. The men tried to persuade Odysseus to steal Polyphemus's cheese and animals and then make a quick escape. Odysseus insisted on staying. When the Cyclops came home, Odysseus demanded a gift. Now, this may, might seem a bit weird. Why would you break into someone's house and then demand that they give you something? Uh, and this is because of a part of Greek culture that we no longer have today. Uh, I don't know if I told you this before, but in those days, um, there, you know, no, I think I told you this before. Let me re refresh your memory. Uh, traveling was very hard. It's, and you don't know everyone who comes to visit. You don't know everyone that you go to visit. So as part of their culture, to make sure that travel, safe travel is still possible, uh, it is a rule that if anyone ever comes to visit you, you first have to let them clean up and then feed them. And only after that, after dinner, can you ask them, who are you? Why are you here? So that's why Odysseus, it says here, demands a gift. He is a guest. He comes from far away. So he's saying that the host, Polyphemus, should feed him and, and wash him and let him tell his story. Um, so like that's the proper way to do things. Uh, let's continue. Polyphemus refused and ate two of the men. He then went to sleep. The door stone of the cave was too heavy for the men to move, so they were trapped inside. Again, imagine you are one of Odysseus's men. You just saw 
two of your fellow soldiers picked up and had their heads bitten off by this giant. And now it's night, he's there asleep, but you can't get out. All you have is eight hours of pure terror awaiting what will happen in the morning. Next morning, Polyphemus ate two more men and then set out for pasture with his flock. Remember, he's a shepherd, has a muyangan. So in the day, he, he lets his sheep out. Odysseus prepared a sharp olive wood, ganlamu, steak, zhuangzi, uh, to blind Polyphemus. You know, luckily he only has one eye. When the Cyclops returned, he ate two more men. Apparently, one man is not enough uh, to fill his stomach. Odysseus then offered him some wine. He drank too much. Classic story. Odysseus claimed his name was No Man. When the Cyclops passed out, Odysseus and his men shoved the stake into his eye. Polyphemus called for help, but no one came because he said that no man had hurt him. So you can see Odysseus is a smart guy. Next morning, the blinded Cyclops opened the doorstone, counting the sheep and goats as he let them out to pasture, because he's trying to catch Odysseus and his men. Odysseus and his men escaped by clinging to the animals' bellies. As they sailed away, Odysseus shouted back to taunt Polyphemus and revealed his true name. Polyphemus hurled a huge rock that almost destroyed the ship and called on his father, Poseidon, to curse Odysseus. Now, if you remember, Poseidon is the god of the sea. Odysseus is sailing on the sea to try to get home. So this is probably not a good thing for him to have the god of the sea curse him. And that's where we are at the beginning of book 10. The winds and the witch. Uh, in the original, the books did not have names. These names were added by the translator. Uh, so Odysseus continues his story. We reached the floating island of Aeolus, who is well loved by all the deathless gods. So Aeolus is a person. Uh, the island is his home. A floating island uh, could either mean that it's floating in the air or that it moves around, so you're never quite sure where the island is. Around it, on sheer cliffs, uh, sheer here means just means vertical, chuizida. You can't climb up. On sheer cliffs, there runs a wall of solid bronze, huangtong, impregnable, wufa chuantong. Twelve children live with him in his palace, six strong boys and six girls. He arranged their marriages, one sister to each brother. They are always feasting there with their parents at a banquet that never ends. So they're always eating. By day, the savor fills the house. Savor here just means the, uh, the smell of food. The court, Gongting, reverberates with sound uh, because it's a party. At night, they sleep beside the wives they love on rope beds piled with blankets. So that's the background of this place. We arrived at that fine citadel, Baole. He welcomed me and made me stay a month and asked for news of Troy, the Argive ships. Argive means Greek, so the Greek ships, and how the Greeks went home. I told him everything. See, this is what a good host should do, right? Somebody comes to your door, you make them stay and eat for a month, let them tell their story, and then you see how you can help them. At last, I told him he should send me on my way. 
he has to go. So he agreed to help me, and he gave me a bag of oxhide leather, and he tied the gusty winds inside it. Zeus, the son of Cronus, made him steward of the winds. Steward means uh, guanlizu, manager, I guess. And he can stop or rouse them as he wishes. He bound the bag with shining silver wire to my curved ship, so no gust could escape, however small. And he made zephyr, which is the west wind, blow so that the breath could carry home our ships and us. But it was not to be. Uh, this is still a phrase in English. It, it was not to be, which means uh, that did not turn true. Of course, it's a phrase in English. This is an English modern translation. Our folly ruined us. Folly here means something like Yuchun. For nine days and nights we sailed, and on the tenth, our native land appeared. We were so near, we saw men tending fires. Uh, so remember, like each city is its own country. So around the island, there will be like guard stations and lighthouses. And so you need fire for light. So men tending fires is not some random people burning things on the beach. Men tending fires is soldiers keeping the guard lights on through the night. And the day, because like if the fire goes out, it's hard to start a new fire. So it's always the guard fire is always burning. Uh, we were so near, we saw men tending fires. Exhausted, I let sweet sleep overcome me. I had been doing all the steering, hoping that we would get home sooner if I did. But while I slept, my men began to mutter, saying the great Aeolus gave me gifts, silver and gold, that I was taking home. With glances to his neighbor, each complained. It seems that everybody loves this man and honors him in every place we sail to. He also has that loot. Loot is the most valuable From sacking Troy. To sack a city means to destroy a city. We shared the journey with him Yet we come back home with empty hands. And now Aeolus has made this friendly gift to him. So hurry, we should look in the bag and see how much is in there, how much silver, how much gold. That bad idea took hold of them. They did it. Again, notice the English. A bad idea takes hold of someone. It's like once you have this idea, you can't forget about it. You, it, it consumes your attention uh, until you have to do something. So that's what they did. They opened up the bag, and all the winds rushed out at once. A sudden buffet, Changfeng, seized us and hurled us back to sea, the wrong direction, far from our home. You know, you would think like there are four winds in the bag, right? North, south, east, west. It just so happens that the wind that comes out first is not the wind that would blow them home. It's the one that blows them away. Very unlucky people. Uh, okay, line 50, continuing. They screamed, and I woke up and wondered if I should jump off the ship or drown or bite my lip, be stoical, and stay among the living. I endured it, covered my face, and lay on deck. Like when you're sailing on the sea, you can't control the wind. So Odysseus thinks that his only two options are to jump ship, or to lie down and wait for the wind to stop. 
And so he chooses the second one. Bite my lip here just means stay quiet, not say anything. Be stoical. Sidogershipai is the ancient philosophy that says uh, the only thing you can control in life is your own emotions. Those are the philosophers who said, like, uh, if all of my family and friends die and I lose everything, I don't have to be sad because I can control my emotions. So in English, it just means to to uh, endure the tough situation. Okay, uh, I endured it, covered my face, and lay on deck. A blast of storm wind whooshed the ships back to the island of Great Aeolus. They began to weep. Uh, this is his men. His men began to weep. We disembarked, which means to get off the ship, and filled our jars with water, and hungrily the men devoured their dinner. When they were done, I took one slave with me and one crew member back to see Aeolus. So this tells us Odysseus doesn't just have men, he also has slaves with him. So we can imagine like he's the, the leader, he gives orders, he plans the next uh, move. His men uh, row the ships, take up weapons, carry out tasks. And the slaves probably are the ones who cook and wash and clean. So they go back to see Aeolus. He was at dinner with his wife and children. Of course he was at dinner with his wife and children. The poem told us their feast never stops. We entered and sat down beside the doorposts. So, like, notice they didn't walk all the way in, right? They sit next to the door, probably because they're very embarrassed. Startled, they asked, Why are you here again? You had bad luck? What happened? Surely we helped you go on your way and meant for you to reach your homeland where you wish to go. I answered sadly, Blame my men and blame my stubborn urge to sleep, which ruined us. Dear friends, you have the power to put things right. I hope these words would soften them. Uh, and, and this is not a blind hope. Odysseus is a master storyteller, right? He is powerful with his words. So this is one of the few times where his language does not save him. So I hope these words would soften them, but they were silent. Then the father yelled, get out, you nasty creature, leave my island now. It is not right for me to help convey a man so deeply hated by the gods. Convey, of course, means chuan di, or I guess chuan song. You godforsaken thing, how dare you come here? Get out. So like, of course, if this guy is cursed by the gods, you want to get as far away from him as possible. Uh, just in case whatever happens to him also happens to you. OK, continuing. He roared and drove us from his palace. Dispirited, we sailed away. The men grew worn out with the agony of rowing. Our folly had deprived us of fair winds. We rowed six days and nights. The seventh day, we came to Lystragonia, the town of Telepolis, upon the cliffs of Lemos. A herdsman there, returning to his home, can greet another herdsman going out. Uh, and the footnote tells us that uh, this is unusual. Usually herdsmen or shepherds, Mu Yangren, only work during the day. But in this place, they work in the day and in the night for some reason. 
A sleepless man could earn a double wage by herding cows, then pasturing white sheep. The paths of day and night are close together. Uh, and footnote three tells us the paths of day and night are close together probably means that it is at a high lati uh, latitude. Uh, I'm not quite sure why. Oh, OK, I guess maybe they reached there during the summer, so it looks like there's no night or something. We reached the famous harbor. The famous harbor. So again, if anybody knows anything about the Lystragonians, uh, most of their knowledge is about the harbor, Haigang, which tells us that maybe uh, they didn't get far enough onto the island to learn more important information. Right, they pass by, they see, oh, there's a harbor, and then they leave. That's why they're still alive. Famous harbor, all surrounded by sheer rock cliffs. On each side, strips of shore jut out and almost meet a narrow mouth. Mouth here is Gangkou, Kaikou de Rivang. No waves rear up in here, not even small ones. White calm is everywhere. So all the others harbored their ships inside, crammed close together. I was the only one who chose to moor my ship outside the harbor, fastening the cables to a rock away away, which means uh, it's kind of far away. I disembarked and climbed a crag to scout. A crag is a piece of rock that is that sticks out of the ground, or in this case, sticks out of the wall so that he can climb up. And to scout just means to gather information. I saw no sign of cattle or of humans, except some smoke that rose up from the earth. I picked two men and one slave as the third and sent them to find out what people lived and ate bread in this land. Haha, <laughs> he thinks that they eat bread. <laughs> they disembarked and walked along a smooth path where the wagons brought wood down from the mountains to the city. They met a girl in front of town out fetching some water. She was heading for the fountain of Artaki the whole town's water source. Uh, the name Artaki is also very interesting. It looks a lot like the word autarky, which today means a country that does not depend on anyone else. So their economy is entirely depending on themselves only. So in the same way, the Lystragonians don't seem to depend on other people. Any anytime someone new comes, they just eat them. Uh, so this girl was the strapping child of Antiphates, king of the Lystragonians. They asked her about the king and people of the country. Uh, see, so back to the earlier question, uh, how do they know about this place? Maybe because uh, Odysseus is telling the audience information that he learned during the adventure, but they did not know this before. So they asked her about the king and people of the country. She promptly took them to the high roofed palace of her own father. When they went inside, they found a woman mountain high. They were appalled and shocked. The giantess uh, ESS is Nu Xing. At once, summon the king to her husband, sorry, summon the king her husband from the council. He tried to kill my men, and grabbing one, he ate him up. The other two escaped back to the ship. The king's shout boomed through town. Hearing the mighty Lystragonians thronged from all sides, not human-like, but giants. 
with boulders bigger than a man could lift. They pelted at us from the cliffs. So boulders, a juicy. We heard the dreadful uproar of ships being broken and dying men. Uproar is a loud noise. They speared them there like fish. So the idea is they throw rocks to destroy the ships. So the men jump from the ships into the water. And then the Lestragonians uh, take their weapons and spear them like they're spearing fish. A gruesome meal. While they were killing them inside the harbor, remember Odysseus is outside the harbor. I drew out my sword and cut the ropes that moored my dark cheeked ship. And yelling to my men, I told them, row as fast as possible away from danger. They rode at double time, Shombei Sudu, afraid to die. My ship was lucky and we reached the sea beyond the overhanging cliffs. The rest, trapped in the bay together, were destroyed. So Odysseus loses most of his men here. Uh, I think in the Iliad it said that Odysseus brought 500 men to Troy uh, in 10 ships. So each ship had 50 people. So here he loses around 400 men, 400 to 450 men. We sailed off sadly, happy to survive, but with our good friends lost. We reached, I never know how to read this place, Aeya. In the original Greek, it should be Ayaya. Home of, the, the, the idea is that it's a very weird name. It only has vowels, it doesn't have consonants. Which tells you it's a very weird place. We reached Aeya, home of the beautiful, dreadful goddess Circe. So she's a goddess who speaks in human languages. The sister of Aetes, whose mind is set on ruin. So her sister is the goddess of ruin, of disaster. So Circe probably is not a good goddess either. Those two are children of the sun who shines on mortals and of Percy, child of ocean. So this tells us that uh, Circe and Aetes are actually older than Zeus because the sun and the ocean gave birth to Cronus and Cronus gave birth to Zeus. But if these two are the son, are the daughters of the sun and the ocean, they are in the same generation as Zeus's father. So these are old goddesses, old and powerful goddesses. Under the guidance of some god, which just means luckily, we drifted silently to the harbor and we moored there. So the lucky part is that they were silent and they were not noticed. For two days and two nights, we lay on shore, exhausted and our hearts consumed with grief. On the third morning, brought by braided dawn, I took my spear, uh, chang, 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 and sharp sword, and I ran up from the ship to higher ground to look for signs of humans, listening for voices. So Odysseus has learned his lesson, right? Last time he sent his men. This time he goes himself. I climbed up to a crag and I saw smoke rising from Circe's palace, from the earth up through the woods and thickets. Thickets is shu chong. I considered if I should go down and investigate since I had seen the smoke. 
but I decided to go back down first to the beach and ship and feed my men and then set out to scout. When I had almost reached my ship, some god took pity on me in my loneliness and sent a mighty stag with great tall antlers to cross my path. So a stag is Gonglu. You know Gonglu? Continuing. He ran down from the forest to drink out of the river. It was hot. So it's not the river that's hot. It's the stag who is hot. That's why he's drinking from the river. I struck him in the middle of his back. My bronze spear pierced him with a moan. He fell onto the dust and his spirit flew away. This really is a sign from the gods. Like suddenly you have food. Uh, this is something that you would pray for. I stepped on him and tugged my bronze spear out and left it on the ground while I plucked twigs and twines and wove a rope. So twigs are xiao shu zhi and twines are xiao xi shen and wove a rope. A fathom's length. A uh, fathom. Yi zhang. Well knotted all the way along and bound the hooves of that huge animal. So basically, Odysseus makes a rope. Like, do you guys know how to make a rope? He makes a rope. And he ties the stag's four feet together. I went down to my dark ship with him on my back. I used my spear to lean on since the stag was too big to be lugged across one shoulder. I dumped him down before the ship and made a comforting pep talk dachi, to cheer my men. My friends, we will not yet go down to Hades, which means we will not yet die. Sad though we are, before our fated day. Come on, since we have food and drink on board, let us not starve ourselves. Now time to eat. They quickly heeded my commands and took their cloaks down from their faces. Uh, and in the footnote tells us that the reason their cloaks, Pijen, were in front of their faces is a sign of grief. And they marveled, which means they, they go, whoa. They marveled to see the big stag lying on the beach. It was enormous. When they finished staring, they washed their hands and cooked a splendid meal. So all that day till sunset, we sat eating the meat aplenty and the strong sweet wine. When darkness fell, we went to sleep beside the seashore. Then the roses of dawn's fingers appeared again. So it's the next morning. I called my men and told them, Listen to me, my friends. Despite your grief, we do not know where darkness lives nor dawn, nor where the sun that shines upon the world goes underneath the earth, nor where it rises. We need a way to fix our current plight. Plight means situation but I do not know how. I climbed the rocks to higher ground to look around. This is an island breathed about by boundless sea. This is important information. If you are sailing in a part of the world you don't know and you reach land, you don't know whether like how big the land is. It could be an island. It could be a whole new continent. You have to actually find out that information. Uh, in fact, this is uh, true in history also, like back in the 17th and 18th centuries when Europeans were sailing around the world. Uh, sometimes 
someone would pass by a new uh, piece of land, but they couldn't stop. Like maybe they didn't see any beaches where they can uh, put their ships. Maybe they're running out of food and they need to get home. For whatever reason, they can't stop, but they pass by and it looks kind of big, so they call it a new land. But then later when the, they send someone else to look at this place, it turns out it's just an island. So this is something that actually happened. So he says, uh, this is an island wreathed about by boundless sea. The land lies low, which means there's no big mountains. I saw smoke in the middle rising up through the forest and thick bush. At that, their hearts sank. Since they all remembered what happened with the Lystragonians, uh, their king Antiphates, and how the mighty Cyclops devoured the men. <laughs> so usually if you're sailing somewhere you don't know, and you see a place with a house and there's somebody living there, the normal reaction is to be happy. <laughs> but they've been through so many terrible situations that their reaction is to be scared. Uh, remembering all the previous times that they discovered somebody new and died for it. Okay, so now they're scared, right? They wept and wailed, hao ku, and shed great floods of tears. But all that grieving could do no good, which means it was useless. I made them wear their armor and split them in two groups. I led one and made Eurylochus command the other. We shook the lots in a helmet made of bronze. Eurylochus's lot jumped out. Uh, to draw lots uh, But in ancient Greece, instead of like putting them all in a cup, they threw them all in a helmet and they shake the helmet, and the first one to jump out of the helmet is the chosen lot. Uh, so in this case, Eurylochus, his group has to go. So he went with his band of 22. Okay. It says that he divided his men into two halves. So at this point, they have 44 men out of 500. They have 44. So he went with his band of 22, all weeping. Those left behind with me were crying too. Inside the glade, they found the house of Circe built out of polished stones on high foundations. Round it were mountain wolves and lions, which she tamed with drugs, yelping. They did not rush on them, but gathered around them in a friendly way, their long tails wagging as dogs nuzzle round their master when he comes back home from dinner with treats for them. Just so, those sharp-clawed wolves and lions, mighty beasts, came snuggling up. The men were terrified. Like... They're scared, first of all, because these are dangerous animals, but also because whoever lives here turned these dangerous animals into house pets, into like cats and dogs. So it must be a very powerful person. They stood outside and heard some lovely singing. It was Circe, the goddess. She was weaving as she sang, say Feng Ren, an intricate, enchanting piece of work, the kind a goddess fashions. Then Polites, my most devoted and most loyal man, a leader to his peers, said, Friends, inside someone is weaving on that massive loom and singing so the floor resounds. Perhaps a woman or a goddess. Let us call her. They shouted out to her. 
she came at once, opened the shining doors, and asked them in. So thinking nothing of it, 就是别无其他想法 Thinking nothing of it, in they went. Eurylochus alone remained outside, suspecting trickery. Uh, 已有诈 She led them in, sat them on chairs, and blended them a potion, 魔药 of barley, cheese, and golden honey, mixed with Pramnian wine. She added potent drugs to make them totally forget their home. They took and drank the mixture. Then she struck them using her magic wand, 魔杖 and penned them in the pigsty, 把他们赶到猪圈里面去了 They were turned to pigs in body and voice and hair. Their minds remained the same. Again, can you imagine this? You are turned into a pig, but your mind is still the mind of a human. This is fucking crazy. They squealed at their imprisonment, and Circe threw them some mast and cornel cherries, food that pigs like rooting for in muddy ground. So Circe gives them pig food. Eurylochus ran back to our black ship to tell us of the terrible disaster that happened to his friends. He tried to speak, but could not, overwhelmed by grief. His eyes were full of tears. His heart was pierced with sorrow. Astonished, we all questioned him. At last, he spoke about what happened to the others. Odysseus. We went off through the woods as you commanded. In the glade, we found a beautiful tall house of polished stone. We heard a voice. A woman or a goddess was singing as she worked her loom. My friends called out to her. She opened up the doors, inviting them inside. Suspecting nothing, they followed her. But I stayed there outside, fearing some trick. Then all at once, they vanished. I sat there for a while to watch and wait. But none of them came back.、Uh, so you'll notice that this part is very similar to what Odysseus has just told us.、Um, in the original Greek, these two parts should be almost exactly the same, but in the translation, it's a little different、uh, because、uh, the translator is trying to fit the meter. Go do. So she's adjusting some words here and some words there. But the original is exactly the same, and you can think about this. It's the same story, but it's told from two different perspectives. One is the storyteller; the other is the voice of the person who actually went through the events. So even though the words are the same, they probably sound very different and feel very different to the original audience. At this, I strapped my silver-studded sword across my back, took up my bow, and told him, "Take me there." He grasped my knees and begged me tearfully, "No, no, my lord, please do not make me go. Let me stay here." Okay, notice what he does. He he grabs onto Odysseus's knees. In ancient Greek culture, this is the traditional way to beg somebody. You you fall to the ground, grab someone's knees, and then you, with your other hand you reach for their face. This is the traditional position to beg. It's kind of like、uh, in in ancient China, people would kow tow, would ke to. It's the same kind of、uh, situation. Let me stay here. You cannot bring them back, and you will not return here if you try. Hurry! We must escape with these men here. We have a chance to save our lives. I said, "You can stay here beside the ship and eat and drink, but I will go. I must do this." He says, "I must do this." Again, he cares so much 
about the men that he has left. Uh, since Eurylochus couldn't say what happened to them, Odysseus feels like he himself has to go and find out. I left the ship and shore and walked on up, crossing the sacred glades, and I had almost reached the great house of the enchantress Circe when I met Hermes, not the fashion company, the god, uh, the god. Hermes carrying his wand of gold. Hermes is the messenger god. He is the god of uh, who sends messages from the other gods to mortal people. He is also the god of the traveler. And of course, here Odysseus is a traveler. Uh, so he's carrying his wand of gold. He seemed an adolescent boy, the cutest age, when beards first start to grow. He took my hand and said, why have you come across these hills alone? You do not know this place, poor man. Your men were turned to pigs in Circe's house and crammed in pens. Do you imagine you can set them free? You cannot. If you try that, you will not get back home. You will stay here with them. But I can help you. Here, take this antidote, jie yao, to keep you safe when you go into Circe's house. Now I will tell you all her lethal spells and tricks. She will make you a potion mixed with poison. Its magic will not work on you because you have the herb I gave you. Herb is the yao cao. When she strikes you with her long wand, then draw your sharpened sword and rush at her as if you mean to kill her. She will be frightened of you and will tell you to sleep with her. Do not hold out against her. She is a goddess. If you sleep with her, you will set free your friends and save yourself. Tell her to swear an oath by all the gods that she will not plot further harm for you. Or while you have your clothes off, she may hurt you, unmanning you. This is a very interesting word, unmanning, to make you not a man. So you can imagine what kind of harm she may try to cause him. To cut off his, you know. The bright mercurial god. <laughs> Sorry, that's a joke. Uh, the word mercurial is actually a joke. Uh, because Hermes, uh, okay, so the ancient Romans used a lot of the same gods as the ancient Greeks, but gave them new names. So the Roman name for Hermes is Mercury. So here the translator is having a small joke, calling him a mercurial god. Uh, in English, the word mercurial means uh, which is not a way to describe Hermes. The bright mercurial god pulled from the ground a plant and showed me how its root is black, its flower white as milk. The gods call this plant moly. It is hard for mortal men to dig it up, but gods are able to do everything. Then Hermes flew through the wooded island back towards high Mount Olympus. I went in the house of Circe. My heart pounded as I walked. I stood there at the doorway and I saw her, the lovely Circe with her braided hair. I called. She heard and opened up the doors and asked me in. I followed nervously. She led me to a silver studded chair, all finely crafted, with a footstool under. In a gold cup, she mixed a drink for me, adding the drug. She hoped to do me harm. I sipped it, but the magic did not work. Let's stop here. Uh, so remember, next week, please read the end of book 11 and then uh, up to page 143 of book 12.